The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. My name is Tara Massad and I work in the University of Chicago's program on the global environment. Tonight, the program on the global environment is excited to be partnering with the Shedd Aquarium and the University of Chicago's Center for International Studies to bring together an excellent group of researchers working to understand how global, global change will affect ecosystem and societal health. Tonight, we're privileged to host two highly respected experts on the causes and consequences of sea level rise, as well as to have with us one of the Shedd Aquarium's own research biologists who will address issues associated with the with Lake Michigan's current record low levels. Our first speaker is Dr. Ben Strauss, the Chief Operating Officer and Director for the Program on Sea Level Rise for the Research and Information Sharing Organization, Climate Central. Dr. Strauss is not just a scientist, but also a communicator, setting him among few people who provide the service of transmitting scientific research to the public. Dr. Strauss excels at this, and his recent report, Surging Seas, has been widely reported on in the popular press, including the New York Times, NPR, and major television networks. Prior to working for Climate Central, Dr. Strauss helped found Grist.org and started the Environmental Leadership Program. Dr. Strauss publishes actively on the topic of sea level rise and its projected effects along the U.S. coastline. Following Dr. Strauss, we'll hear from Dr. Anthony Oliver Smith, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of Florida. Dr. Oliver Smith was also the Munich Re Foundation Chair on Social Vulnerability at the United Nations University Institute on Environment and Human Security from 2005 to 2009. He's devoted his career to studying involuntary displacement and resettlement across the globe and has recently focused his expertise on understanding how sea level rise will affect vulnerable coastal communities. He's authored and edited numerous books and has contributed to his field with over 75 book chapters and journal articles on disasters and displacement. Lastly, Dr. Philip Willink of the Shedd Aquarium will speak on the alarmingly low lake levels of Lake Michigan. Dr. Willink joined the Shedd just last year and is serving as the senior research biologist for the Center for Conservation and Research, working specifically to evaluate Illinois' list of threatened and endangered species. He studied fish biology for over 20 years and is focused specifically on endangered and invasive species, particularly in the Great Lakes region. Tonight, we're here to learn about how global change is affecting our interactions with water in the form of rising seas and lowering lake levels. These problems call on us to engage as members of local, national, and international communities. At home, global warming and increased consumption are causing the levels of Lake Michigan to recede. Along our nation's coastlines, increased flooding from massive storm events is increasing in frequency, and these natural disasters are only the most obvious effect of sea level rise along our shores. The Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast are particularly vulnerable to rising sea levels. And even if global warming emissions were to cease by 2016, a 60 centimeter rise in sea level by 2100 is still predicted. If the global community adheres to the goals set forth in the Copenhagen Accord and the Cancun Agreements, an increase in sea levels of over a meter is still expected by 2100. The science, can you hear me? Well, okay, there we go. The science that goes into producing these estimates is constantly becoming more sophisticated, which is important because these numbers are based on complex physical realities, such as thermal expansion, precipitation patterns, glacial dynamics, and ocean currents. Beyond the physical science involved in understanding global change and the policy work devoted to climate change mitigation, the fact that environmental change is already in motion regardless of future mitigation requires us to also consider adaptation to our changing planet. The community of Chicago may have to adapt to water shortages in the future. The communities of New Orleans or New York will have to adapt to losses of land and resulting increased reaches of storm surges. Communities in Alaska are already having to relocate as erosion and sea level rise consume their homelands. These are all issues we're here to discuss this evening. We'll hear from our three panelists and then open the floor for questioning after all three of them have spoken. Before we begin, though, I would like to announce the next World Behind the, Progr World Behind the Headlines program on January 31st. Demeter Karanov, a freelance journalist and Pulitzer Center guarantee, will discuss shale, grass, shale gas from Poland to Pennsylvania. 
I'd also like to let you know that the program this evening is being videotaped and will be available to be viewed on the Center for International Studies website. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ben Strauss, who will talk on rising seas and surging storms, an analysis of a present and growing threat to America's coasts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Strauss. Thanks so much, Tara, and uh, thanks to the Shedd Aquarium, the Center for International Studies, and uh, the Program on Global Environment. It's nice to be here on the first uh, seasonal day of winter. So uh, Tara asked me to talk about um, causes of sea level rise and the risks that, and, and threats that it's posing um, to U.S. coasts. But I thought that I should start with something a little bit more specific than that. It's hard not to start with Sandy. I live, in, uh, I live in Manhattan, so I was there. Although, fortunately, I was on the electrified side of, of the island. Um, fortunately for me, this is, this is a photograph taken by the Coast Guard of uh, part of Long Beach Island, which is on the south side of Long Island, and uh, one of the most low-lying communities uh, in all of Long Island. Let's see. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, but before I, I get into uh, what happened with Sandy, I want to do a quick bit of time travel. Uh, this is a sketch of Lower Manhattan in 1883. And this is a recent photograph. Um, in the... Uh, during the same interval, uh, something much less dramatic, but also inexorable, was happening, which is that there were 15 inches of sea level rise. Um, 15 inches of sea level rise measured. Uh, actually, there's been a station in place since about 1856, uh, but we have more confidence since 1880 uh, in its readings. So, and those 15 inches made Sandy worse. Um, what caused those 15 inches of sea level rise? The first thing, actually, is that the land is sinking. Uh, in fact, land is sinking over most of uh, the lower 48 states. Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, contemporary climate change. It is kind of an echo from past natural climate change. Uh, ice sheets, you know, used to occupy the Great Lakes and most of Canada. Uh, they came down to uh, New York City. And they had incredible mass. The ice was miles thick, and it compressed uh, the land underneath it like uh, you compress a mattress when you sit on a mattress. But besides compressing the land, the ice not only compressed the land underneath it, but it also pushed the land, it created a bulge in the land beyond it. So when you sit on that mattress, the other, so the other part of the mattress goes up. It goes down underneath you, but it goes up away from you. And when you get up, the part that you were sitting on rebounds, but the part away from you actually goes back down. So all of the lower 48 states are going back down now because those great ice sheets have disappeared, and they're no longer pressing down on Canada. Uh, and that sinking is, accounts for about seven inches a century of um, sinking land in New York City. Call it half a foot. And it varies from place to place. It's a little faster for New Jersey uh, and the Chesapeake, uh, and it's slower as you get down to Florida. So that was about half of those 15 inches of sea level rise. What about the other eight inches, the slight majority? That came from global warming, uh, from uh, warming leading to sea level rise for a variety of reasons. And 
Uh, so there have been eight inches of global sea level rise, global average sea level rise, since 1880. And uh, it's come from several different factors. Uh, the one we understand the best is that the ocean has been warming. Uh, this is a picture of the somewhat uneven warming of ocean surface uh, in uh, the last half century or so. And as water warms, uh, it actually expands. So the sea level rises. In the forward-looking projections, we expect uh, this thermal expansion uh, to account for maybe a foot of sea level rise per century. And this is the part that um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and climate, science, climate scientists generally have the most confidence about projecting. It's very tightly related to temperature, uh, uh, atmospheric temperature change. But there's also the retreat of glaciers. Uh, the small mountain glaciers around the world uh, have been uh, retreating rapidly uh, over the last century. This is just one before and after picture. You can Google it online and, and find um, hundreds of them. Uh, I also highly recommend the movie Chasing Ice. Uh, if anyone has a chance to see that, it's, it's a really... Um, it got a, a lot of dramatic imagery and, and video um, of just this phenomenon. Um, so the glaciers have contributed um, several inches, we think, to those eight inches over the last century. And there are maybe two or three feet left in all of the mountain glaciers of the world. That is, if all of the Himalayan glaciers and the Andes and... Uh, uh, Alaskan glaciers and so forth, if they all melted, it would add two to three feet uh, of sea level globally. Now, the third factor uh, related to warming uh, is loss of ice from the great ice sheets, uh, which occupy Greenland and Antarctica. And that is where we know the least, uh, but the picture the potential is greatest, the picture is most alarming. Uh, there are close to 200 feet of potential sea level rise locked up in the Great Ice Sheets. Most of that is in East Antarctica, which everyone agrees is, um, would take a long, long time to go. Uh, but about 50 feet worth of sea level rise are in more vulnerable uh, areas like Greenland, West Antarctica, and the Amundsen Sea region of uh, Antarctica. Uh, a paper came out uh, within the last few months that was a, a pretty definitive analysis of uh, ice mass loss from uh, Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, I, uh, close to 10 teams teamed up internationally and agreed. It was actually a huge development. Uh, they agreed on a set of numbers, uh, and they found that um, the rate of ice loss from uh, Greenland and Antarctica is still relatively small, but it's bigger than we thought, and it's accelerating. And there's loss from both uh, Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, in particular, Greenland, in the early, uh, the, the first decade of the 21st century, the last decade, that is, uh, is losing ice about five times faster than it was losing in the early 90s. Um, whether that is a, a fluctuation or a long-term trend, uh, no one can say, but it certainly has um, matched, you know, it matches a striking warming. So there's a real, real warning sign um, coming out from Greenland. I'd like to come back to New York. So... Hurricane Sandy, 15 inches. But Hurricane Sandy's storm surge reached just over nine feet above the high tide line. What's 15 inches? Or what's the eight inches that came from the warming component? What difference did that make? Um, well, in our analysis, actually, it, 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 there, were, there were a lot of other things that made this storm awful, but um, sea level rise was a certain contributor 
So we find between eight and nine feet, about 6,000 people live in New York City per vertical inch. And if you analyze the land and see how many people live on it, um, 6,000 per inch. So eight inches, 50,000 people. That's something. Um, another way to think about it is, here's a picture from Hurricane Irene, which happened the year before. We actually have now, of the top 10 highest floods at the Battery in New York uh, since 1900, three have happened in the last three years. Um, Irene was about five feet above the local high tide line and did no discernible economic damage. So Irene marks, uh, that is, from coastal flooding. It was, it was very low compared to Sandy. So Irene establishes that you can get the water to five feet, but it's, and that's not so bad on a temporary basis in New York City. But nine feet is Sandy, catastrophe. The difference, 50 inches. So eight inches is about 15% of those 50 inches. Another way to think uh, of what difference, you know, when the transformer blew up on the Lower East Side that took power out from Lower Manhattan, did it clear the last barrier by two feet or by half a foot? Um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of discussion and hand-wringing in the climate science community, and it's a very difficult task. Whenever there's a heat wave or a storm, we t you know, was this climate change or how much of it was climate change? Uh, how did climate change change the odds? We're still struggling with how to talk about these things, but under our noses is this one climate impact, which is rock solid. Every single coastal flood, which happens today, is roughly eight inches deeper because of warming. Um, that means the flood footprint is larger. Some people get wet who wouldn't have gotten wet. And it also means the damage is greater because um, damage goes up uh, non-linearly with depth of water. Um, a four-inch deep flood in your basement is more than twice as bad as a two-inch flood, especially when you get up to the electrical outlet levels. There are a lot of little details like that. Okay, um, now I want to talk about some moving away from New York, uh, speaking a little more broadly. Um, with colleagues, I published two papers in March uh, where we attempted to do a, a kind of quick national assessment of vulnerability to sea level rise and coastal flooding. Um, and we were fortunate to receive a lot of attention. This was kind of an arrival moment for me when you have a syndicated uh, cartoonist uh, uh, doing something related to your research. Uh, 3.7 million is the number of Americans who live less than one meter above their local high tide line uh, in our research. So it turns out to about, about one million people per vertical foot um, is the number. Uh, so that was our national headline. We've got a lot of uh, people, housing, and economic assets concentrated on the coast. At the state level, uh, our headline is that Florida has got almost half of the national exposure. So there is huge exposure in Florida, um, especially in South Florida, also Louisiana. Um, and, you know, Jersey is pretty big for its size. Um, but Florida is, is, the, is the leader here. <laughs> Not, no one aspires to be. And, and Florida also has special trouble because South Florida, um, the bedrock, and I, I mean, I only learned this a year into my research on sea level. The bedrock in South Florida is, it basically looks like Swiss trees. It is porous limestone. So that means you cannot build a seawall or a levee um, against sea level rise. The water will push underneath it and come up, seep out of the ground on the other side. So um, now drilling down to a finer level, we're looking at counties, and you start to pick up you know, pockets of vulnerability. Um, and besides South Florida and Louisiana, you can see, well, New York and Long Island. Um, here, let's see. Uh, 
if I can get this. There we go. Laser. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, some parts of coastal. Where are we? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the Jersey Shore. Uh, a lot of that's from dense population. Charleston. Um, a surprise to me was Orange County, but their uh, Long Beach was in, is the nation's second largest port. Uh, is extremely flat and low lying, and uh, there's a lot in the bay, a lot of vulnerability in the Bay Area, extending all the way to Sacramento. Very low Sacramento Delta. Uh, this is the same picture, but instead of looking at total numbers, which are influenced by population density, this is percentage of population. Uh, so here, you know, New York lights up red, and that's because even though a few percent, only a small percentage are uh, exposed at low elevations, uh, there are so many people there. Uh, here, when we look at percentages, the picture shifts a little bit, and you see, you know, the uh, Pacific Coast gets off relatively scot-free, but suddenly you have a lot more vulnerability in, say, North Carolina here. Um, picture looks a little different. Uh, and this is drilling down to the level of cities. Uh, this is one infographic. All you can see is uh, about 2,000 cities. The length of the lines are a nonlinear scale of the number of people who live less than four feet above their local high tide line. And the shade represents the percentage, so darker blues are higher percentages. Um, and you can really get, you know, this is probably uh, Huntington and Long Beach in there. And you see some, there's some actually dark blues way in by, that's probably Stockton and places around Sacramento. And then you get various pockets, uh, probably somewhere in here is the Norfolk, Virginia area. Uh, and then uh, Florida is kind of overwhelming. And if this were a linear scale, like the lines from Florida and, and New York and Louisiana would go far off the screen here. Um, here's a simpler way to look at it. Uh, here I rank states and counties in Florida. I don't include Florida because it would go way off the scale, but these are popul hundred, you know, thousands, populations by the thousand living less than four feet above local high tide, you can see that two counties in Florida top every other state besides Florida or Louisiana. Um, now let me move um, briefly uh, into uh, projections and the timing of this risk. In our second paper, we made localized projections of sea level rise. I'm sorry, but these are back in meters. I'm, I'm, uh, I need to do this figure uh, with feet. But, uh, you know, we, I think we were the first to do localized projections, which took into account different rates of land subsidence and kind of local components of sea level rise, as well as global projections. Uh, and you can see that there's some variation. The, the redder points uh, are, are places where the land is sinking. Uh, pretty rapidly, uh, Chesapeake Bay and, and Western Gulf of Mexico, uh, especially. So we get up to, you know, about half a meter, uh, one and a half feet by mid-century. But uh, here are the hundred-year return levels of storms. So no sea level rise here. This is just your one in a hundred-year storm, your awful storm. How high does the storm surge get? And you can see that the numbers are 10 times higher than sea level rise. And this is one of the challenges we have in thinking about sea level rise and its hazards and communicating the risk. Because actually, you know, just, just like you know, we, we, we say the world is ending, the, you know, global warming is going to warm things by two degrees, and you, you say, well, okay, but it just warmed up two degrees in the last half hour where I am. Uh, so... Natural variation is, uh, of um, storm surge is pretty large compared to the sea level rise we're projecting. And we um, wanted to look at, uh, you know, what, what's the threat that sea level rise is posing in this context. And you see, especially in the Gulf here, there are some pretty big 100-year uh, storms uh, that push water to 15 feet above the local high tide. So what we did is, we did an analysis to say, well, when you take sea level rise into account, 
by the middle of the century, how often does, you know, what's a 100-year storm today, how often does it happen in 2050 with the sea level rise we're projecting? And that's where it gets interesting. You actually see that in the Gulf, almost nothing happens. Very, very little significance of sea level rise. And we probably think of the Gulf first as a place that's vulnerable and flooding. Um, there are other challenges there. But when you do the analysis, there, there, there are other um, challenges I think sea level rise is posing in the Gulf, like destroying protective wetlands that help protect against storm surges. But because there are such high storm surges uh, naturally in the Gulf, you know, what's a, what's a foot of sea level rise when you get a 10-foot or a 15-foot storm surge as a regular, um, as a fairly regular event? Not regular event, but the, you know, an event you could experience. On the other hand, in Southern California, today's 100-year event is a once a year. It's an annual event by the middle of the century. And that's because they really don't get big storm surge. Uh, and there's very little separation between today, you know, there are, their 100-year event maybe is three and a half feet above uh, the local high tide line, and their annual flood is maybe three and a quarter feet. Uh, and so it takes only a few inches to change the century flood into an once every year. And so the places, the places where you see the reds and the oranges are places where people are going to see water getting places where they never saw it get before. Uh, and so that means trouble because all of our roads, all of our infrastructure, all of our housing, all of our laws and our jurisdictional boundaries are all designed in that world of last century and before. They're not designed for this world. Um, and here's another analysis we did. We, we looked forward to 2030 and we said, okay, we would expect... Um, you know, what, what, what difference is sea level rise from global warming making by 2030? Let's look at the probability of an extreme flood, you know, a once a century grade flood as defined today. What's the chance of that in a world with no sea level rise? No past sea level rise from warming, no future sea level rise from warming. Um, and what's the chance of that in a world with sea level rise? And you can see the difference between the red lines with sea level rise and the blue lines without. Uh, 55 places we analyzed, uh, about two-thirds had doubled, tripled, or higher risks of these extreme floods because of sea level rise from global warming, not including, not including a subsidence of land uh, in this risk. So there really is a, a changing risk landscape and the way we're going to experience sea level rise in the near term, it's not that poster of how the map looks at the end of the century. It's more and more floods coming higher and higher um, today. Uh, it's already here, we just don't label it that way. Um, so quickly, I'd like to, I, I have a couple minutes left, I just want to advertise. We have an online uh, application where you can go and type in any zip code, any city name, any county, and get our analysis of population, housing, and land exposed from one to 10 feet above local high tide, and also get the localized projection timeline of risk. Um, here's a zoomed in map. You see a bubble for time. <laughs> we say that there's an at least one in six chance of uh, a flood reaching five feet above local high tide in Long Beach, uh, New York, by 2030. Well, we beat those odds, it seems, or, or the odds were defeated. I'm not sure quite how to say that, but Sandy made it to nine feet, uh, well beyond our projections. Uh, got, also got a little bit of analysis on uh, infrastructure exposed. Uh, a lot more of that will be coming over the... Uh, next year, uh, and uh, our report that Tara mentioned at the beginning, uh, free for download, all at surgingseas.org. Um, and finally, I just thought I'd end with a, a kind of quick, bigger perspective. This is directly measured from the air carbon dioxide concentrations uh, 
on a volcano pictured there in uh, Hawaii, Mauna Loa, the famous killing curve, kind of simplified, just over the last 50 years in blue. Now here, you see that same blue line, but it's in the perspective of the last 1,000 years. Uh, evidence taken from ice cores, little bubbles of carbon dioxide, uh, little bubbles of atmosphere, let us read the concentration uh, trapped in the ice cores. And now we expand it to 400,000 years. Uh, and I'm not showing the near present yet, and so I'll now I'll unveil it. And uh, the blue and red is the last 100 years. They alternate in 25-year cycles. So here you have civilization beginning, 1800, and then the 20th century in blue and red. Uh, and there's a group out there called 350.org, which is generally seen as a, you know, it's a fringe, crazy group that says that 350 parts per million is maybe a safe level, right? So that's the fringe group. And then the mainstream has kind of said, well, let's bring it down to 450. 450 should be our limit. It used to be 550. But this provides the perspective on what we're talking about with those numbers. Um, here is that long-term CO2 record again with temperature. Again, I'm cutting it off at the margin. And there's the last bit of time with a CO2 spike and no response, not much response from temperature yet. If we zoom in uh, just to the last 100,000 years uh, on temperature, you can see that the last bit of time was extremely stable, extremely stable. So all of civilization has developed in this exceptionally stable, unusual period. It's not normal what we've had uh, to grow all of human civilization and agriculture. Here is a uh, zoom into the last 2,000 years, and you see we're starting to push up. So we're kind of shoving on that boulder of rare stability and trying to push it, get it going down a hill uh, or up a hill. Temperature versus ice volume. Ice volume tracks pretty well. Um, and here's just the last 20,000 years. Carbon dioxide, temperature, and 400 feet of sea level rise. Uh, just from that much CO2 increase in warming. To put that in a broader perspective, the yellow band, uh, which stops just before that red spike, we saw 400 feet of sea level rise in that period. Uh, and the last warm period highlighted there, sea level was 20 to 30 feet higher than today. It was maybe a degree warmer than it is today. Um, so that is a picture uh, of uh, what the map of uh, North America would look like if sea level rose 25 <laughs> feet, kind of back to that level of the, the last warm period. Um, and you've lost the boot of Louisiana and, and all of southern Florida. Uh, and you have a new Great Lake forming in the California Central Valley. Um, and that 25-foot line is, uh, I, I, I um, recently had an op-ed in the New York Times and uh, laid out with a colleague three kind of markers, 5 feet, 12 feet, 25 feet. If we if we embark on a um, program of reducing emissions more strenuous than anyone is talking about, a kind of wartime mobilization scale, um, we would stand, in, in my view, we would stand uh, some chance of limiting sea level rise in the long run to about five feet. Uh, on the other hand, uh, business as usual, we very quickly commit ourselves to 25 feet. Good reason to believe that we're there with two degrees Celsius of warming, and we're almost already at one. And everyone right now is saying that we probably can't avoid two degrees C, but this could be the long-term commitment. So um, the forward-looking thought is, and, and that could have, you know, this is looking back a few hundred years. This conversation is looking forward a few hundred years. A few hundred years sounds like a long time away, but when we look back, it's a time that is in our cultural memory, and we look back at events as heroic. It's, it's, it's very alive uh, in our historical memory. 
Um, so the question is, in a few hundred years, how will our descendants be looking back on us and the choices we make uh, today? Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Strauss. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Oliver Smith, who will discuss of storms and surges, sea level rise in population, displacement, and resettlement. OK. <clears throat> well, um, first, let me say that I'm happy to be here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Program on Global Environment, University of Chicago, Shedd Aquarium, for sponsoring this event. Um, I, uh, I, I, as Ben said, this, was, this is a, an interesting day from the point of view of weather. Uh, not climate, necessarily, but weather. Um, I went running last night in Gainesville, Florida, in a t-shirt. Uh, and I arrived this afternoon, and I saw people running along Lakeshore Drive. And I thought, this is really different here. Um, <laughs> And I'm a northerner. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a transplant, like almost everybody in Florida. Uh, and interestingly enough, I, I, I work prior to quite recently, I work primarily in the Andes. So the issue of glaciers is very close to my, to my uh, original interests. But Florida's flying, finally gotten to me, and so now I am working on issues of sea level rise. And as Ben uh, mentioned, uh, Florida's really in for it. Um, and so uh, we, are, uh, we are paying a lot of attention uh, to sea level rise now. Um, what I'd like to do today, uh, tonight, is to talk a little bit about the human impacts uh, of sea level rise. Um, there's no denying that, uh, that uh, sea level rise has a, a huge potential to impact human communi communities. Um, and, uh, and I think that one of the things that we need to, to uh, come to grips with is how are we going to deal with this? Uh, what will be the reaction of or the response of populations up and down our coasts um, to sea level rise? Um, will adaptations be possible that will allow people to maintain residence uh, and stable communities in place? Uh, how costly, both in economic and social cultural terms, will these ad adaptations be? Will there be mass displacements and uh, migrations? Uh, and will these migrations or displacements be completely environmentally driven, or will they be uh, the result of a combination of factors coming together that is political, economic, social, as well as environmental. Uh, and um, will, and here I'm speaking in, a global, in global terms, will these populations be internal or will they migrate internationally? Right now, India is building fences to keep, allegedly, to keep people who will be displaced by climate change in Bangladesh out. Um, and if these migrations or displacements take place, will they be the result of sudden onset events like Hurricane Sandy, which indeed has displaced a lot of people? We don't know how permanently uh, or how temporarily. My guess is that it's going to there'll be a fair amount of permanent displacement. Um, or will these displacements be because of slow onset, gradual processes in which uh, little by little, people, in effect, realize that they can no longer maintain uh, uh, their residence in certain areas, and they will gradually uh, withdraw themselves. Um, and another issue is, will these displacements and migrations be the result of individual and family decisions, or will what will be the role of the state? Um, will And will it be done on an individual or family basis, or will whole communities move? And if they move, will they move together? Uh, and again, I'm talking about, I'm talking, I'm speaking globally here. Uh, 
And each society will come to grips with these issues in its own particular way. This is not going to be a kind of mechanical sea level rise, people move, and it'll all be the same all over the world. Each community comes to face these issues with its own sort of its own package of social and cultural and political and economic variables. And so it will not be a mass global uniform kind of movement. It's going to be very, very different, very complex. There will always be a mix of, of issues that, in effect, uh, drive or uh, induce people to move. So I've given you a lot of questions. And the answer to these questions is, today, fairly conjectural, but probably yes to everything. Uh, <clears throat> but clearly to, to, to address these questions, we need to come to them at the multiple levels at which they exist. That is not, a, not just the environmental, but the social, the cultural, the economic, the political. Um, okay. Uh, more or less what, I'm, what I'd like to do here is just talk a little bit about, about global climate change and sea level rise. You've already gotten a great, a much better introduction to this issue than I could do. Uh, and the issue of physical exposure. Uh, and then so the issue of sea level rise and social vulnerability. Uh, and then migration. And then the issue of displacement and resettlement. If we're going to see, if we're going to see a lot of people displaced... Uh, what do we know about displacement and resettlement? Um, are we just going to say, well, we'll just move people back from the coast and they'll be safe, end of story, no problem? Um, or will it be more complex than that? And indeed, in some cases, I think you will, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be drawing on a lot of different fields here that have talked about displacement, uh, that sometimes displacement becomes a secondary disaster. Uh, and then, then we'll talk a little bit about research and policy needs, if there's time. Okay, the social impacts of, of sea level rise. Um, we need to know a lot more about the interplay between um, environmental change. Oh, come on. Ecological systems. socioeconomic vulnerability, and the social impact of environmental change. In other words, this is a whole integrated process here. We can't, and we don't really understand very well yet how all of these factors come together and how they affect the way people will respond how, and what will happen with people. Now, vulnerability science has told us, has, we've, we've learned that in effect, that pure exposure doesn't give you an answer. In other words, simply being exposed to climate change or to any environmental stressor um, gives you enough of an answer to be able to, to, to say, this is how a specific population will respond. Okay, so... When we talk about vulnerability, vulnerability is the, the, basically those conditions that, in effect, make a population vulnerable to a natural hazard or to any hazard. We need to distinguish between vulnerability and exposure. Vo exposure is, a, is an outcome of, in some senses, geography. That is, where you are, where, what, where you are in place relative to a particular hazard. Vulnerability is a socially constructed condition that comes out of the interplay of social, economic, political, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, and cultural features. So we have environmental degradation with the degradation of the resource base, the alteration of natural processes through global environmental change. We have hazards that in effect are affected by global environmental change. 
We have vulnerability over here, the loss of traditional coping practices, and less access to livelihoods, rapid urbanization, and these are not, these are just uh, elements. This is not a complete list. And effects, which we get with certification, deforestation, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, the in increased risk. Okay, so in effect, we're talking about a very, very complex interaction of multiple variables. This is not the kind of thing where you can say X is going to cause Y. It, and as a matter of fact, direct causation is a very rare thing in the natural world, or in the social world for that matter. That is, direct causation is every time you have A, B must follow. That's not the case. Another of the, of the tables that I was going to show you is from the work of uh, uh, McGranahan and his colleagues who looked at uh, populations around the world in, um, that uh, inhabit what he called the low elevation coastal zone. And that is from one meter to 10 meters above sea level. And one meter, uh, basically 10 meters of sea level, this is, in some, in some sense, it's kind of a factoid here because 10 meters and one meter of sea level, what really is important is the topography because what we're going to see in sea level rise and storm surges is the reach, the inland reach of storm surges. So in effect, if you have a 10 meter cliff, no, you're not going to have that problem. The fact is, as you have, as it, your, your coastal topography if it's relatively shallow, you will see much greater uh, reach inland of storm surges. Um, so, okay, we're here. Well, again, these are just the meters, and as you saw from, uh, in effect, South Florida virtually disappears. Um, large parts of the, of the Gulf Coast go as well. Next slide. And this is a in Asia, and these are from uh, your colleagues, <coughs> uh, uh, and in effect, you have in this area in Bangladesh and in Vietnam, you have somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 million people uh, who will be very, very much at risk with even one meter of sea level rise. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is the, uh, the McGranahan slide that I just uh, uh, wanted to show you. And you look at, here is incredible exposure. But not only is there incredible exposure here, there's incredible vulnerability. That is, the social and economic, political and cultural factors that make people, that render people vulnerable to the impact of a hazard. They may have relatively low exposure, but because they are vulnerable, they will suffer grievously in these. So in effect, when we see the outcome of a disaster, we are seeing not just people who are exposed, but people who are exposed and vulnerable. There may be vulnerable people who have less exposure. <laughs> and there may be very wealthy people who live in very, very risky environments, but because they have resources, social and cultural and political and economic resources, they are not particularly vulnerable. So this is a, this is a very important distinction that has to be made here. Uh, it is not just exposure. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, um, some of the areas that are going to be at very, very great risk are, are deltas and estuaries and bays. Again, you see the Mississippi, the Gulf Coast there is sort of at medium risk. <coughs> Sorry, high risk. And you see the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna, uh, 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 delta in uh, Bangladesh at very, very high, and also the Mekong is very, very high, and the Nile as well. <coughs> All three of those areas, well, those, those three areas have extraordinary high levels of vulnerability, and higher than the Gulf Coast. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to move fairly quickly here because we've lost quite a lot of time. This is a list of 
simply, this comes from the, uh, the IPCC uh, report from 2007, uh, of areas that are at risk and in terms of why they're at risk and some of those areas. Next slide. Uh, natural system effects, uh, inundation, wetland loss, coastal erosion. Coastal erosion is going to do a great deal of damage. It's already doing a lot of damage, for example, in the islands of Alaska. Uh, next slide. Okay, we've got, in terms of understanding what's going on and how we can deal with the, the impact of these, uh, of these processes on human population, we have a number of, of real challenges. We don't have very good data on existing conditions at least in, in specific circumstances. Um, and uh, we are, we're, we're just beginning to come to grips with these problems in terms of what the impacts, the human impacts are going to be. We can sort of generalize and say, oh yeah, well, people are gonna be flooded, or not just in, in climate change by sea <coughs> level wise, but also desertification. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so what's going to happen in terms of, of, of uh, the impact on populations in terms of their uh, issue of, of displacement? Well, we know that sometimes they will be proactive. That is, they will say, uh-oh, things are happening. It's time, to, it's time to go. Sometimes it'll be reactive. That is, it'll happen, and we have to respond, and we will leave. Sometimes it will be voluntary. That is, people will say, yes, it's time to go. I, I, I make the choice to move. Other times, people will say, no, I am not moving. I am tied to this land. I'm going to tough it out. We saw that happen. We see it happen in every hurricane. Um, and sometimes it will be forced. People in Vietnam who were moved by the government to reduce risk of flood, when they were asked, uh, <coughs> Why they, why they moved, why they were displaced. Were you displaced by the environment? No, 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 the government displaced them. In effect, the state took a, a role and said, you, you are in danger, we are gonna move. Sometimes it'll be temporary, sometimes permanent, sometimes the danger is physical, sometimes it's economic, and sometimes the move is administered. That is, the state comes in and organizes a displacement, and sometimes people <coughs> migrate. Next slide. So there's flight, there's escape, evacuation, displacement. Again, what's my time on? Okay. Um, we need to sort of specify what our terms are here. Um, and uh, so sometimes you will see uh, an evacuation uh, that is almost the same as flight. Sometimes an evacuation will be administered. Uh, the dis displacement of people, that is, people will move, be moved from the home ground. Uh, they may not be resettled. That is, they may in fact just migrate off and resettle themselves or migrate to cities or whatever. Sometimes they will be resettled. Uh, and Forced migration generally refers to much longer, in other words, you're not moving 100 yards back, you're moving over large, larger spaces. Next slide. So, in terms of sea level rise and displacement, what combination, the, these are basic questions that we have to come to grips with. What are the, what's the combination of factors of sea level rise and social vulnerability that will require major adaptation? One of those major adaptations may be, may be movement. Second is, are there culturally constructed adaptive mitigative strategies that will enable people to live, to, to, to remain? In other words, when you build defensive structures, we can't do that in Florida. But maybe you can do it along the coast of New England. Uh, you can't do it in Bangladesh, right? But they're thinking about doing that in New York City. Uh, at probably half the cost of what Sandy uh, uses. And if people are displaced by sea level rise, what's going to happen to them? Where will they go? And what will they do when they get there? And these are questions that we really haven't begun to answer. Okay, so 
almost an unasked question. So one of the things we've seen is that on different <coughs> forms of displacement, uh, we will see people move, and they will assimilate with co-ethnic. That is, people who share their language, their religion, their culture. I have a friend who did research with Angolan refugees in Zambia. Very interesting comparative research. What he, what he saw was that he, he studied a group of people who were fleeing <coughs> the Angolan Civil War. Some went to refugee camps, and some simply crossed the border and settled with co-ethnics. These were Luvale people. And so when they settled with co-ethnics, the Luvale of Angola settled with Luvale people in Zambia. And so what happens is that the people who were in the refugee camps felt displaced, the people who were with co-ethnics never felt displaced. Camps and urban migration and resettlement. That is, sometimes there will be supposedly temporary camps that turn into permanent camps. There are refugee camps in Africa that are 40 and 50 years old. And of course, the Palestinian refugee camps are 50 and 60 years old. Urban migration, so many people are displaced and simply go off to the slums of the burgeoning megacities of the world, and then resettle. Next slide. OK, what do we know about resettlement? Well, we know from camps, that is, the conflict, refugees. We know about disaster-induced displacement. And we know about development forced displacement. That is, when the government comes in and says, we're building a dam here, you're gone. You are going to be moved. Up until 30, 40 years ago, people were simply moved. They were told to leave. Over the last 30 or 40 years, a large literature, a large, uh, has emerged on development force displacement and resettlement. We've learned a lot about the process from largely developed. Next slide. The problem is that despite the fact that we've learned a lot about things, we don't do it very well. That's one of the major issues that we have to come to grips with. We've learned a great deal about what goes on in displacement and resettlement, and how costly, how traumatic, how grievous the losses are. But we have not been able to do it well. So Michael Chernia, who was the chief sociologist at the World Bank for about 20, 25 years, <coughs> came up with what he called the impoverishment risks and, and reconstruction model. And this is what happens in displacement and resettlement. That's why we can't say that people displaced by sea level rise, if we just move them back to the coast, all done, no problem. This is what happens to people who get displaced. Social networks, they're kin, you break up communities, and for the poor, social networks enable them to access resources that they cannot get money with. Political, they lose power, and you have a power differential between your host, that is the receiving community, and the guest. Cultural, you lose a sense of place and sense of identity. Who are you? Most people in the world identify with a place. Not always, not in every case, but place, and particularly this is true for indigenous people. Place is part of identity. And then grief. We've known for 50 or 60 years that people uprooted grief for a lost home the same way they grieve for a lost person. <coughs> this is one of the things that uh, uh, Ted Downing and, and Carmen Garcia Downing did a study of what he called psycho, psycho cultural recovery. And there are a number of 
about who are we, where are we, and how do we relate to one another. In other words, how are we part of a social group? First, there has to be a social group. Displacement threads a social group. And so part of that part of that process is how do you reconstruct the community? Next slide. This is I'm I'm really rushing here because uh, Displacement and resettlement are hugely complex processes. Uh, there are so many changes that are taking place in the context of imposed racial change. There are so many political and economic issues that are at play in which the people who have been displaced are struggling with the people who displaced to actually defend their rights. And so what we need is less of a kind of, well, what my colleague Chris Beck calls uh, more money. We need a much less linear, much more open-ended, much more participatory approach. That is, people have to be involved in their own result. It can't be done for them. Next slide. It takes place in some <coughs> Three levels, the individual has to heal, a household has to stay together, and the community has to reconstruct itself. Unfortunately, resettlement's usually seen as a material process. Here's the money, here are the houses, we're done. That's the end of the story. In other words, it's just a material transfer. When in effect, resettlement is a total reconfiguration of a community. One of the ways that we can address some of these issues is to see resettlement as a, de as a development process. That is, as an investment, you make an investment, and you include the people in the investment. Next slide. Uh, again, very, very quickly, what is the role of the state? And in, in uh, much of the world today, what will be the role of the private sector? We have seen many state functions now, in effect, being transferred to the private sector. We are seeing the private sector take a role in, in resettling populations. Um, next slide. Okay, so future trends. Well, we're going to see increases in sea level rise. We are also seeing continued coastal, coastward migration around the world. Populations are moving to coasts. Asian cities, in particular, are exploding because of coastal migration. So we have we need a future focus on adaptation and mitigation through vulnerability reduction and exposure reduction. But we also have to focus on the issue of resettlement as a last resort. Because it is so it is such a traumatic process. It is not a simple transfer, but very a very complex undertaking with very high costs. So, uh, for sea level rise, and I would say for climate change in general, what do we do? Well, obviously we have to adapt. But, do we only adapt? Or are, do we need to engage in some fundamental changes? And I think that climate change can create a political imperative to bring about the kinds of structural changes that we need to address poverty and vulnerability. Because it's poverty and vulnerability.
Thank you all for your patience, and thank you, Dr. Oliver Smith, for working through that difficulty. Our last speaker is Dr. Willink, who will talk on Great Lakes lows, causes, impacts, and future projections for lake levels. All right. Uh, we just heard two excellent presentations on sea level rise and water levels going up. Uh, interestingly, in the Great Lakes, the fixation's on the exact opposite problem, lake levels going down. And there's an interesting social commentary here, which I'm not going to make now, but I will make at the end of my presentation. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is changes in lakes levels, both up and down. Uh, we're going to look at some past patterns, and then we're going to try to figure out if we can figure out what has caused these patterns over time. We'll look at some models for predictions of how these levels may change in the future. And then we're going to discuss about how these uh, changes in the lake level may impact biodiversity and the people living in the region. So here it is, the Great Lakes. Um, we're right on its doorstep right here. Uh, we have Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, Ontario. Uh, they are indeed all interconnected to some extent. Superior flowing into Lakes Michigan and Huron, which in turn goes into Lake Erie which in turn flows into Lake Ontario, which in turn goes into the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> now, in the interest of time, and because there's been a lot of media attention on this tonight, I'm really just going to focus on Lakes Michigan and Huron uh, right here. Uh, but keep in mind that the patterns that I'm talking about tonight are fairly similar in all the other lakes as well, even though each one of these lakes has its own particular history and circumstances. But in order to keep things manageable, I'm really just going to talk about Lakes Michigan and Huron. So Michigan's here, Huron is over here. Uh, traditionally, we treat these as two lakes, but if technically, from a hydrological point of view, they are not two lakes. They are actually just one lake that happens to get pinched in the middle. So you often hear it referred to as Lake Michigan-Huron or Lake Huron-Michigan. And so this is going to be the focus of what we're um, tonight. Uh, this is a screenshot from a website called Great Lakes Water Level Dashboard. I would encourage you to Google this when you go home. It's a great tool. Um, it shows the changes in lake levels. This is Superior, Michigan-Huron, Erie, Ontario here. Uh, you can play around with the dates. You can zoom in. You can look at predictions. You can look in the past. You can do all kinds of different things. And I'm going to be showing a number of screenshots from this. Um, and this is a pretty accurate representation of the data that is often presented right here. Um, one of the things I do want to point out on this particular slide is you do see that there are similar patterns among some of the Great Lakes. And yet there are differences in some of the Great Lakes as well. Um, but overall, you see a lot of ups and downs. They're always in a state of flux. They're always changing, and they have for a very, very long time. Uh, some of these changes are more long-term. Some are very short-term. Um, and so looking at a particular short-term change, and here's the obligatory Sandy slide in all our presentations. Um, so. It's, Hurricane Sandy was certainly not the disaster in Chicago as it was on the East Coast, and yet it was still a pretty massive storm by the time it got here. As you can tell from this picture that I took just several hundred yards from where you're sitting right here. This is on Northerly Island. Um, just to put this in perspective, here's our lake wall or sea wall, and the water level is usually several feet below that. Now, when waves are crashing, that creates a bit more of a dramatic picture. Um, but what else was going on here is there was a storm surge as well, and this was a, uh, because of the sustained winds blowing in a particular direction, and that st storm surge was around two to three feet here in Chicago. You could see this in some of the harbors. But after the winds died down and the storm moved on, the water levels returned back to normal. But it took a few days to a couple weeks to reach that point. That was a change in the lake level, but it was a relatively short one. Um, another pattern, if we step back a little bit, uh, this red line is the long-term average over the past century of lake levels in Lake Michigan and Huron. Um, each one of these dots is a monthly average, and each of these lines is a year. So this is January to December. And you'll see as the year goes on, the lake levels go up and down, up and down. Typically low in the winter, go up, peak in the summer, down in the winter, up summer, down in the winter, up, up and down, up and down, oscillates like this. And this fits in very nicely with the melting snow in the springs, spring rains, and then we typically have less precipitation 
um, in the months of August, September, and October. Um, so this is yet, here we go. And also notice that the changes within a year can be anywhere from one to two feet. All right, so the lake level is going up and down one to two feet a year, and that's normal. That's fairly typical. Uh, if we step back, no, we're okay. <laughs> uh, these are some stumps and logs on the bottom of Lake Huron. The reason these are interesting is they're under about 40 feet of water and were dated to about 7,000 years ago. In other words, 7,000 years ago, Lake Huron was much lower than it was now and there was a forest. All right? Uh, there's also some underwater forest in Lake Michigan, not all that far from Chicago. Okay? So lake levels were significantly lower then than they were now. As a matter of fact, since the deglaciation, lake levels have been going up and down significantly. Sometimes quite a bit, sometimes more. And, uh, there were times that this auditorium would have been underwater. All right? Now, some of you may be saying, academically, this is all very interesting, what happened 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Uh, but most people are really interested in what's happening now, in the here and now. So we can take a look at that as well. Here are the patterns over the last century or so, starting in the year 1918, going all the way up to last month, all right, the end of 2012. Once again, general patterns, we see a lot of up and down. It's never very stable. Low periods here in the 30s. 60s, some highs in the 40s, highs in the 80s, and then here we have our record low last month, at least within this time frame. Um, one thing that I want to point out in this slide is that if you go from the peak to the low, that's a difference of around six feet. All right, so we've seen changes in the lake levels of around six feet just in the matter of the past century. Um, but it's not unusual to go up three or four feet during particular times. Now, lake levels going up and down, we've known that for a long time. What is really catching people's attention now is what's going on right here in the here and now over the past few years. Lake levels have gone down, but they're not going back up. There's still some fluctuations, but something else seems to be going on here. And the concern is, is this a long-term pattern or what's going on and how is this going to impact us? So now the hunt is on. We're going to take a look at this and see if we can try to figure out what might be going on right here. Um, there's often a lot of attention on the Chicago River. Uh, so around 100 years ago, uh, the number of canals were dug in the area, and these had the, um, the impact of facilitating the flow of water between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River. All right. Uh, did this impact lake levels? Yes, they probably did. Lake Michigan probably dropped a couple of inches because of this. Maybe a little bit more. There's a little bit of a debate about it. But in general, it probably did drop a couple of inches. However, there have been no significant modifications in the past century. This was all about 100 years ago. So even though it may have dropped the long-term average some, it doesn't seem to be playing a role in the recent pattern that we see. Some people are pointing attention at the St. Clair River. And there's actually a lot of debate about this right now, because over the years, the St. Clair River has been dredged, sometimes significantly. And the reason this is important is that this is the primary outlet for the Lake Michigan and Huron as the water pours through here into Lake Erie and elsewhere. So if this is dredged and lowered, more water flows out of these Great Lakes. Now, have the lakes, has uh, the St. Clair River been dredged? Yes, it has been. This is data over the past 100 years or so. And you can see that in the 30s and in the 60s, there was a significant amount of dredging. There has been some since, but not as much. All right. How does this fit with the pattern of our ups and downs? Keep in mind, 30s and the 60s. In the 30s, yes, there was a drop here. 60s, yes, we do see something of a drop here. However, lake levels were declining a little prior to the dredging. And then after the dredging, in each instance, they went back up. No significant dredging over here, and yet there was still a drop. All right. So is St. Clair really responsible for the recent trends? Probably not for this particular part. It probably has had an impact of dropping the average lake level over the long term. Estimates are around a foot to a foot and a half. There may have been subsequent erosion. Once again, this is people are arguing about this at the very moment. Um, that may have dropped lake levels another few inches or may be responsible for that as well. Uh, but once again, it doesn't seem to be primarily responsible for this particular pattern right here. Another factor influencing lake levels. Precipitation. 
So this seems pretty obvious. Rain and snow falls into the lake. The more water going into the lake, the higher the lake should be. Let's take a look at this. We won't get too, too sophisticated, but I'll show some graphs. Um, here we see low rain levels in the late 20s, 30s, so the Dust Bowl era. Other lows, 60s. Moderately highs in the 40s, 50s. A lot of rain in the 80s. And unfortunately, this data ends around 2005. But this is averaged over the entire basin. Okay. So here's another data set. This one's actually just for northeast Illinois, so it's a smaller region. It's a bit messier, but once again, sort of shows the same patterns. We have lows here, 20s and 30s, lows in the 60s, less rain, a bit more right here, a bit more, a lot more in the 80s. And then it doesn't actually show there, there's a decline over here. It only goes to 2010, so it doesn't show the past couple of years. So we see some lows, but not a lot of dramatic lows. If I drag this over and kind of superimpose it over the lake levels, we do see something of a match here, all right? We got less rain, lower, river, uh, lower lake. A little bit more rain, lake goes up, less rain kind of goes down, a lot of rain. That's when we get our peak levels. But then it goes down, but it doesn't go down, it doesn't seem to do, uh, go down as far to explain all of this, and yet we still have some high years, but we don't see any recovery here. All right, so precipitation does seem to play a major role. It is influencing the system, and we're getting closer, but that doesn't seem, the, seem to be the whole picture. We just have another major piece of it. Another part of the picture is evaporation. Now, a lot of people know when it rains and snows. It's pretty obvious when that's going on. A lot of people don't realize that evaporation is going on, and a tremendous amount of water can be lost from an aquatic system via evaporation. You're going to mainly just going to have to take my word for it. Um, most of it's invisible. Um, now, has there been any changes in evaporation rates in the past decade or so that we might be able to look at? Well, I'll show you a couple of pictures and you tell me. I took this picture last week. Now, I scraped an inch of ice off my car yesterday. Okay, so obviously it was pretty cold then, but a few days ago it was 51 degrees. And I took this picture, the Adler Planetarium was on my back. Uh, this is Navy Pier, here's downtown Chicago, so it's only a few hundred yards from here. This is what it looked like a few days ago. I took this picture two years ago. All right. Now, obviously, it's in a blizzard. Um, that's a bit of an artifact. Um, there's a lot more snow then. Here's Navy Pier. You can barely see the ghostly outlines of Chicago. Once again, Adler Planetarium is right behind me. What's the major difference in this picture? A lot of ice. The harbor was completely iced over. Now, I'm not going to say there was no ice this year, but there's been very, very little ice this year. All right. So there's a lot of ice on the lake. How does ice impact lake levels? What it does is it forms a blanket or a protective cover over the lake. And that prevents the water from escaping. It's pretty simple. All right. So when you have the ice cover, you don't have the evaporation, so you're not losing the water vapor via evaporation. You can still get it through snow and rain or whatever, at least eventually when it melts. Okay. <clears throat> By some estimates, Ice cover in the Great Lakes has dropped by 70% in the past decade or two. All right, that's a lot. All right, we don't have nearly as much ice as we used to. Uh, this is primarily, we believe, due to um, warming. Um, the lakes are getting warmer, basically. Now, another factor is, as the lakes are getting warmer, the rate of evaporation increases regardless of ice, or at least if the ice is absent. And if you go through the modeling, there has been a significant increase in evaporation in the past decade or so. And that sort of fits in with what we've been seeing. Now, this is what we're seeing with recent ice. Uh, there's another influence of ice on lake levels in the Great Lakes, and this is old ice, and we've actually already heard about this a little bit, and that that's glaciers. And as these, so 15, 20,000 years ago, the entire Great Lakes were covered with ice. Ice was really heavy. We heard this uh, a little before. Um, it pressed down on the crust. The crust got depressed. As the glaciers retreated, they're melting, they're rebounding, they're popping back up. Now, there's a little bit of an interesting twist here in the Great Lakes region in that this part of the Great Lakes deglaciated first, southern Lake Michigan, or at least down here, whereas over here deglaciated some 
uh, thousands of years later, which means the rate of rebound and settling is slightly different between different sides of the Great Lakes. Uh, what does this mean? This means some parts of the Great Lakes, like the parts of North, uh, Lake Huron over here, are actually rising relative to the other end of the Great Lakes. In other words, they're tilting. They're, tip, they're tipping slightly. And in the process, Lake Huron is actually pouring some of its water into Lake Michigan. Okay? So this is sort of a neat effect, uh, but it's certainly a long-term impact, but it is having a measurable impact on lake levels. So when we're talking about lake levels, it's actually a mixture of a whole number of factors all working together. It's far more complicated than what I'm presenting here, but I think you've got the basic picture. And that we have to look at all of these things right here if we want to make predictions about what's happening or going to happen in the future. And there's a number of models that have done this, and there's a variety of studies looking at what's going to happen in the future based on this, more or less. I'm not going to go through this entire study right here. Um, that's not too important right now, but some of the important points I want to make. Um, uh, this is basically grass for near-term near predictions, like 10, 20 years, this is 30, 40 years, and then this is up to the year 2000. Uh, 90 or 94 or something like that. They've run a number of different scenarios depending upon greenhouse emissions, on and on and on. You can do a bunch of these things. Basically, what I want to say is that a lot of these models have a number of variability associated with it. Sometimes it actually predicts that the Great Lakes levels will go up, and sometimes they predict they'll go down. Sometimes they predict they'll go down a little bit, and then sometimes more. This is, happens to be meters, so we're looking at around 9, 10 feet right here. But most of the models tend to come out predicting that lake levels are going to drop around half a meter, that is one to two feet, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, here's a result from another study. Same idea, this is showing all the Great Lakes in this particular one. Once again, they're predicting Lake Michigan and Huron are going to drop around one and a half to two feet. This is by the year 2099, more or less. Other lakes are going to show similar patterns but not to the same degree. Now, I want to caution that this is long-term average is what they're predicting here. Keep in mind that the lakes are going to fluctuate around this average. So they could easily go up two, three, four feet above this, two, three, four feet below this. I already showed that in the last century lake levels go up and down. They're going to continue to go up and down. This is just a prediction for where we think the average is going to be with the fluctuations around it. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so we're looking at a drop in lake level of around one and a half, two feet in Lake Michigan. What kind of impacts is that going to have on our biodiversity? Well, here's a cross-sectional profile of Lake Michigan. Right now it's at around 923 feet. Let's say we drop at nine feet. This is one of our worst case scenarios by the end of the century, about a 1% decrease. That means Lake Michigan is going to look like this, 914 feet deep. Okay, does that look like a major difference? No, that is not a particularly large difference. Uh, but we'll throw in some other things. Let's throw in some lake trout. We've got some lake trout swimming at the surface. We've got some lake trout swimming a couple hundred feet down, 300 feet down. Are they going to notice a change in lake levels of one to two feet or nine feet? Uh, it's, it's hard to picture a scenario where a lot of the plants and animals living out in the middle of the lake are going to notice much of a difference. Chances are they probably won't. All right, looking just at lake levels. In other words, we will probably still have these lake trout swimming around. I'm looking just at lake levels right now. That's it, not warming or anything else. Okay, now am I saying that there's going to be no impacts on biodiversity in the Great Lakes? No, I'm saying it's a complicated question where some probably won't notice it, but other places might. The places of concern for most of us are nearshore wetlands. And the reason that we're concerned about these is that wetlands are typically in only a couple to several feet of water. So if the lake goes down by three or four feet, they're exposed, they're going to dry up, and then they'll die. Okay? I'm not much of an artist. This is about, as, <laughs> about the most I can do in PowerPoint, and this is about the limit of my ability. Okay. But I could take some pictures. So here's some pretty pictures. All right. I actually took these. Uh, so here's some animals that live in wetlands. Yes, wetlands are a critical part of our ecosystems. We all recognize that. Um, they're important to birds, um, either those that are migrating through or live here year-round. Uh, they're the home to frogs and turtles, and beavers and muskrat and fish and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of fishes use them as spawning grounds. They're also nursery areas for young, both young birds, young fish, other young animals. Um, and then a lot of adults will use them as well. 
Okay. Uh, am I sitting up here telling you that because of lake level declines, we are going to have no more wetlands in the Great Lakes? No. I'm, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. For you see, wetlands are also dynamic and can also move around. All right? Plants can colonize different places. Animals can colonize different places. The trick is it really depends on the rate of change. It also depends on the geography of the particular area. So if lake levels drop rapidly, the wetlands may not have an opportunity to move to different places. If lake levels change slowly, then yes, a wetland can move from one place to another, assuming there's some place near it that is not too steep or too rocky or something like that. Uh, another artifact of this is that the wetland may not have particularly suitable geography adjacent to it, but maybe it is 10 miles away or 20 miles away or 30 miles away, which means these plants and animals have to move that distance. Can they move that distance? Some can do it very easily, some cannot. So it kind of depends on, once again, the rate of change, whether they have an opportunity to do so, whether the habitats are interconnected, and it also depends on the dispersal and the colonizing ability of the various plants and animals we're dealing with, and that's where it gets a bit more complicated. Another layer on this is that a lot of people think that these changing environments will uh, turn over to invasive species. Oftentimes, invasive species are effective colonizers. That's how, what helped them get established in the first place. So does this mean we're going to have just invasive species? Not necessarily. Some invasive species are really good colonizers. Some are not. Some native species are excellent colonizers. Some are not. Once again, we get in a complete mix, and it gets very difficult to predict what these outcomes are going to be. But at this point, I just want to say that... Um, Nature has changed. We've seen the Great Lakes have been changing over time. The plants and animals have been changing with it. By and large, they can adapt to these changes as long as they're not too extreme, too quick, or whatever. Uh, not all, but the vast majority of them will. However, there is one species in particular that has a lot of trouble with change, and that would be people. All right? We don't like change. We make things a certain way. When we want to keep them that way, we don't want to change them that and that's where the problems are coming right now. Lake levels are changing, and it's the people that are being inconvenienced. And here are some potential impacts of this boats. And by boats, I'm saying smaller boats, you know, 30, 40 feet, smaller than that. A lot of people have them. They're in various marinas around the Great Lakes. But as the water levels drop, a lot of these harbors are getting too shallow, and people can't get their boats in and out. So what, is that, what has to be done? The harbors have to be dredged. How much does that cost? Tens of millions, hundreds of millions, possibly into the billions in the Great Lakes alone. It's going to be a huge cost, and it's going to take a lot of time to do it. Um, there's also some debate as to who's going to pay for that, uh, but that's a, almost a whole other talk in and of itself. Um, so that's boats. Uh, then there's shipping, and by shipping, now I'm looking more at the commercial aspects, and I'm looking at freighters, barges, that sort of thing. Once again, they're impacted by the depth of harbors, and that if a harbor is getting shallower, they can no longer carry as much cargo, which means in order to move a certain amount of goods, they have to take more trips. So in the past, by some estimates, what used to be carried by six freighters now has to be carried by seven, which means increased costs for moving those goods. Who's going to burden or who's going to carry the share of these increased costs? You are as consumers. All right. Uh, another aspect of changing is water intake, and this is in like pipes for factories, power plants, uh, drinking water, that sort of thing. If they're in too shallow, they may have to be retrofitted to go into deeper water. And then they're just sort of this lakefront communities. Uh, tourism is a huge business in the Great Lakes, and a lot of towns are built on uh, near shore habitats, have nice beaches. People come and spend time on the beaches, and they spend money in those towns. If the lake levels go down, there's a potential that they may lose their beaches and people won't get there anymore. So what are the, so trying to calculate the impacts on tourism is really hard because the flip side is as lake levels go down, some towns may actually get nice beaches and their economy could go up. So there's a bit of a mix there. It's a bit hard to judge, but it's certainly going to have an impact. <laughs> um, these are some designs uh, proposed for the St. Clair River to try to keep the water levels or stabilize the water levels. Um, in this, they're actually kind of building a dam along the bottom. Here, this is kind of a floating dam that can go up and down when you need it. And over here is putting turbines down on the bottom of the river so you can generate power 
and uh, kind of book, uh, acts kind of like a dam as well. As to whether these are good ideas or not, I'm going to leave that up to you. Uh, this is also a topic of discussion. Um, but what I really want to say right now, is in, and in conclusion, is that nature has changed. I mean, we've seen in the past that um, lake levels have gone up and down. They're going to go up and down in the future. Uh, but it's not just lake levels. I mean, wind creates sand dunes, and then the next day a wind can destroy a sand dune. Rivers meander all over the place, moving across the landscape as they erode one beach and they move to another. So nature is change. Uh, but the conflict is that people want stability. We don't like that. So this sort of sets up the conflict. And that what we really need to focus here is on the conservation of change. Once again, I'm highlighting this whole topic of change. And what we need to do in the future is come up with better ways to, to integrate this idea of change in a number of our plans as to whether we're cons conserving an ecosystem, whether we're managing a park, or whether it's civic planning of a particular municipality along the lake, Great Lakes. <clears throat> we need to take into consideration that this is changing. We've got to let nature do its thing within some extent, uh, but we still have to figure out a way to let people live comfortably alongside it. And so wrapping up, I just want to point out some of the dates that we've been talking about tonight are like 2099, things like this. Uh, I don't want to sound morbid, but most of you are going to be dead by then. Okay. Um, so, so just in conclusion, although we are struggling with these issues right now, these issues are going to continue on for decades and years, years and decades to come. And it's not just the problem that we're facing, it's the problem that future generations are going to be facing as well. And yes, this is my wife, that's my son, and this is Lake Michigan. So with that, I will... Thank you very much, Dr. Willink, and thank you to all three of our speakers. At this point, we have 20 minutes for questioning, and Jamie will be going around with a microphone so that you can ask your question into the microphone. Uh, hi, I really enjoyed the, the panel. I have two quick questions, one for Dr. Strauss, the other for... Just one? Uh, all right. Well, I guess I'll start with Dr. Strauss then. Earlier, uh, well, actually, you finished your presentation with a comment saying it would take a, a war mobilization effort to keep the sea level rise in check at five feet. Um, I would like to, to, for you to extrapolate on that comment. Um, what does that, what in your mind would that kind of mobilization look like? And also, what can the United States realistically do um, since, the, the, since the problem is a global one and the diverse global conditions that are involved, I believe China is the lead uh, CO2 producer right now, regardless that we're, you know, or something along those lines. So if you could just extrapolate on that comment. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, it was actually an analogy I took. Uh, there are a series of really interesting papers written by someone named Mark Jacobson at uh, Stanford that you can Google. And uh, he points out that in World War II, uh, the United States converted a lot of fac you know, car factories into making things like tanks and airplanes. And we, we built um, uh, maybe, uh, I don't remember, 100, 200,000 uh, airplanes in a couple of years. And if we decided to um, put the same kind of energy into building wind, wind turbines, uh, for example, uh, within a few years we would have be generating enough electricity to supply, uh, so suppose we built wind turbines and electric cars, uh, and uh, since the wind blows more at night, use that wind to power the cars, to charge those batteries in the garages overnight. Um, and, and kind of convert our cars into a, a kind of sailboat of, of sorts, um, we could supply all of the energy needs for transportation uh, by the wind turbines built uh, within a few years. So that's, you know, that's the level of mobilization that could see a major shift you know, within a decade. Uh, now, we can't control what China does, but I think, first of all, China is working harder on wind and solar than we are right now. 
uh, they understand. At some, within a few decades, with, with, at some point in the future, and I don't know if it's five years, 10 years, or 25 years from now, it's going to be obvious to everyone, obvious, that this is what we have to do. And, and who, 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 except for the politician, may, but, but it's going to be people who, I mean, the nations that develop uh, competitive industries for the energy sources of the future are going to be in a very good position at that point. Um, the question is whether we can have the foresight to get there. I think China kind of has that foresight and is moving in that direction. So I think we need to take care of things at home uh, and work on the international picture in a parallel track. Dr. Smith? Uh, a while back, Center for International Studies hosted a documentary, and uh, in it, due to natural climate change, human traffickers moved into an area um, from which the men had left to find jobs, and um, they took women and, you know, trafficked them and all that stuff. So, um, so social unrest resulted from national, natural climate change. Do you think it's fair to say that human rights offenses will increase significantly due to, due to um, human-induced climate change? And with what certainty might you think that? Well, <clears throat> I think in, in, um, when, you, when you're talking, <clears throat> excuse me, when you talk about vulnerability uh, and the sort of the, the conditions of vulnerability in which many, many people live around the world, we are talking about fundamental violations of human rights. That is, people are exposed to dangers um, inequitably. That is, human security is unequally distributed. Um, so, just as a <clears throat> from a from a you know a, a baseline, the kinds of vulnerability that people experience around the world are basically violations of human rights because, in effect, the social distribution of security is so unequal. Now, will we see the specific kinds of human rights violations that you're talking about in terms of human trafficking and things like that? that that's a little hard for me to say. I do think that we are going to see populations under increased stress and that those people may, in effect, be forced into adaptations or coping strategies that will fundamentally be violations of human rights. In other words, what we know, what we see, for example, in uh, um, uh, famines, is that very often uh, children will be sold, women will go into prostitution. These are violations of human rights. So I think there's a potential for it, but I can't sort of say here. It's going to happen there. It's not that we don't have that kind of information. I think there's a potential for it, um, and uh, whether it's happening now, I can't. I can't really say. <laughs> Hi, this is Abigail Derby Lewis from uh, the Field Museum. Thank you. I'm back here. Hi. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for your presentations. I don't so much have a question as a comment that I welcome any of you to um, to respond to. We heard about the social impacts as well as the ecological impacts of sea level rise. And what I found really interesting is the interface between those. So thinking about displacement and resettlement and much of that probably happening in coastal areas and how that in turn will impact our natural resources. For example, the National um, Parks Conservation Association came out with their report um, last year looking at the top 10 national parks that were threatened by climate change, Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore being among them. One of those main threats was due to expected migration to this coastal area. And then couple that with what Phil was talking about in terms of nearshore wetlands being some of the most vulnerable and really thinking about, too, this idea that I hadn't thought about before about how culture changes when that displacement and resettlement happens. So much of the way that we manage land and the decisions that we make are rooted, I would argue, in, in our culture. And so all of those dimensions changing, I think, well, it's incredibly complex, and I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. 
Well, <clears throat> let me take a stab at it. One one thing is that um, I I think that people will engage change if they have a degree of understanding and a degree or a sense of control. It is where they do not understand and they feel they have no control that you will see change being most actively resisted. So in effect, if people understand what is taking place and they feel that they, they have a degree of understanding and they have a degree of control over what's going to happen, I th think you see that the resistance to change diminishes. It may not go away entirely. But I want to I want to address something that that uh, Ben brought up in the Mark Jacobson's study. If you go back, uh, you know, uh, if you, some of you may recall, most of you probably won't, um, under the Carter administration when we had the energy crisis, and Jimmy Carter said that he wanted to engage the issue of energy and the environment with the moral equivalent of war. In other words, he was, he was making an analogy to the struggle that we were facing with the kind of thing that Mark Jacobson is talking about. When we mobilized uh, in the effort in World War II and the extraordinary accomplishments that we, that we carried out, um, and what he was trying to do was mobilize the population to come to grips with the energy crisis. And in effect, it fell flat on its face. And, you know, uh, he's, he's gotten a lot of bad press as being an ineffectual president. But in effect, I think that, you know, he was right about that. But what happened was that the population would not mobilize behind the, if, the effort. And I think that, uh, as Ben pointed out, that in order to engage with the changes that we are looking at, that we are going to be facing, we need a, a, a kind of social mobilization that will be akin to what we did in World War II. In World War II, we had a defined enemy out there, and that enemy was clearly uh, it was characterized in very, very negative, evil terms, and and indeed. Uh, it, w it was an extraordinarily destructive um, force that we, that we were facing, and the, and the population mobilized. We are now facing something a little bit, I would say, perhaps more diffuse, less defined in the public mind than a nation, an enemy nation, but in effect a very, very serious uh, challenge. Robert Goodland, who, is the, who, used, who was the, the chief environmental advisor for the World Bank, said, sooner or later we'll be sustainable. We can either, um, uh, if, if we change now, it will be painful. If we wait for things to happen, it will be deadly. Um, very simple, quick other thought on that question, which is an interesting asymmetry between the lakes and the uh, sinking lake level and rising sea level is that, um, well, <clears throat> a lot of the uh, exposed land, well, the wetlands, th there's no development. There's little to no development uh, in the areas where wetlands might migrate <laughs> as lake levels get lower. There may be some places that are too steep or too rocky, but generally that footprint, I'm guessing it's available. With sea level rise, um, you know, there's a hope that marshes might migrate, natural habitats might migrate and, and continue to provide a buffer um, against storms and continue to provide their, um, you know, ecosystem services and, and um, you know, exist as beautiful environments. But there's very de dense development along a lot of the coast. So there's a big problem that you, a marsh has no place to migrate because it's up against a city. And that's, that's an asymmetry. Um, in those different kinds of migrations. This question is for Dr. Willink. Um, there's been a lot of discussion recently about the Chicago River potentially re-reversing because of low lake levels. And I was hoping you could share your opinion on that. I know there's a lot of debate whether or not that's actually feasible, um, as well as any water quality implications, if any, of both the river and low lake levels in general. <clears throat> 
Sure. Okay. Whenever you talk about the Chicago River, it's like 90% politics, and you're going to hear a wide variety of opinions. That's just sort of the nature of thing in Chicago, anything. Um, and you're probably hearing a wide variety of opinions, like it's going to reverse tomorrow and it's going to be an open sewer, and or then others are saying, no, there's no way this is ever going to happen, back and forth. Um, what's really going to happen uh, is a little harder to say and somewhere in between. And the reason I say that is the Chicago River is such a highly manipulated river that we can control a lot of factors on that, so it sort of comes down to what we want to do with it to some, ex some extent. Um, I actually had a slide in the talk. Um, I pulled it out just to show all the locks and dams and everything that are on the river. And there are a fair number of them so that we can control it. So the current situation is that water is flowing from Lake Michigan into the Chicago River, which eventually ends up into the Mississippi. And the idea is that that's a, it's sanitation. Um, a lot of uh, you know what you flush down the toilet goes in through the sewers. Um, uh, treatment plants that ends up in the Chicago River goes that way. Um, and so they maintain the river at a particular level, and at the moment, and I don't know the exact numbers, but it's around six inches or something like that. There's a differential so that the, so that the water flows in one direction out of the river, unless there's a major storm event, in which case it can go in, a, in a different directions. Um, if the lake level, and some are saying this, goes below that six-inch margin, then the Chicago River may naturally start flowing into Lake Michigan. What people are not taking into consideration is we could artificially drop the river level lower to keep it below the lake level if we wanted to. The catch is when we do that, that impedes navigation on the river. So we can drop the river, but it might impede navigation. Now, can we keep barges going up and down the river if the river gets too low? Not if it gets too low, but if it goes down to half a load, we might be able to continue doing that with a lower river. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why this is a very hard issue to really know what the answer is, and nobody really knows what the answer is. Um, based on projections, we it, the Lake Michigan could drop another inch or two this year, and that really depends on precipitation and a number of unknown variables. So we still have a few inches to play with, so it's not like we're going to wake up tomorrow and see this change. If we continue to have drought conditions over another year or two, we will be in a crunch situation where decisions will have to be made, basically. Um, so water quality. Um, in general, um, as lake levels go down, it all depends on what you're dumping into it and where you're dumping into it and whether you can keep things moving. That's a very, once again, a simplified answer. But that's more or less what's going on. Um, I just said that for sanitation, we could possibly control the Chicago River so that it flows in a particular direction. Um, another aspect is we can close the locks uh, along Lake Michigan and we can continue the flow in the Chicago River down, maintain the level in the Chicago River largely, but we're not replenishing the Chicago River with a lot of Lake Michigan water, which means the water quality in the Chicago River will decline, it will lose a lot of oxygen, and a lot of things living there will end up dying. Okay, so people are gonna have to make a choice. Do you let the things in the river die, and we keep the shipping going, and the sanitation going, or do we lower the river and have it go another way, and once again, there's a lot of variables that can go into play there. So the short answer is nobody really knows what's going. We have some time to play with it, but we don't have a lot of time, and it's going to come down to who really wants what, basically. Does that make sense? Okay. Hi. Um, it sounds like the rivers in Chicago don't meander so much from what <laughs> Not you're much. saying. Well, on high floods, they do a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Well, my question is is a follow up on that, and maybe addressed to Dr. Willing, but but certainly spans um, lakes and sea level, and is about the connection between academic and scientific work, and government or civic work. And the basic question is: Has the Army Corps of Engineers ever, in its history, gotten it right? And I'm thinking about um, some recent examples, Sandbridge, Virginia, 300 houses built on a sandbar, and the federal government making a 30-year commitment to keep it there uh, in, in the face of rising sea levels and, well, the sandbar wants to move anyway. And the city of Chicago, $350 million building a massive steel and concrete seawall 
based on lake levels from 86 to 90, which they continue to build to this day and plan to uh, for as long as they can. Um, does anyone ever listen to you? <laughs> I mean, the people who make the policy decisions, the Army Corps who box in the rivers and, and keep the sandbars. And this is a question about your, your concept, Dr. Willink, about the conservation of change. Could you dig into that a little bit um, in, in terms of the government response and whether people actually take this scientific data and apply it to Army Corps projects? Um, yes and no. All right. And I'll be upright, and I know a lot of people in the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, some of them like me, some maybe not. Who knows? Because I have opinions about things. Um, but I will, I mean, once again, it's a very, it's a complicated question. And the Army Corps, sometimes I feel sorry for them because they've been given a particular directive. Sometimes this directive is 150 years old. They have to keep working on it, and they can't change it short of an act of Congress. And I'm not kidding. It takes an act of Congress to tell them what to do sometimes. And so they're stuck in sometimes in a really tough place. For example, in the Chicago River, their primary directive is maintaining the navigation. And so they have to try to do that. And yet now they're thrown in dealing all this time with invasive species, and they're all engineers, or a lot of them are engineers, and so they're in a pretty tough bind with that particular question. I will say that the Army Corps does a lot of restoration projects and is doing more of them in the Great Lakes. A lot of this is part of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And a lot of these projects, I would argue, are actually good restoration projects. Um, and they're looking at doing some on the Chicago River. How much you can do there is a matter of debate. Um, basically because it is a giant concrete channel. So sometimes, yeah, they can get it right. Sometimes they have a tough time doing it right. So, but they're also sort of answerable to a whole, a whole suite of different people. Um, as to whether they always listen, um, you know, eventually they listen to Congress, basically, or the president, and it goes up there. And, but there's also, in any large federal bureaucracy, it takes a long time to do certain things. And so that sort of has to be built in as a lag time. Does that sort of get at what you're asking? I mean, certainly they've had some, some poor, poor designs over the past century or so. And I can think of a lot of river dredging projects. Uh, but now they're thinking of re, you know, undoing some of these dredging projects and re-meandering a lot of streams and rivers, which I think is in the right direction. But it, it's, a, it's very difficult to do those things and very expensive. So it's a mixed bag. I mean, it's just, it's just a huge organization. All right. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. So on behalf of the Program for the Global Environment, the Center for International Studies, and the Shedd Aquarium, I'd like to thank you all for coming and thank all of our panelists for speaking this evening. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.